On March 15, 2014, Lizanne Froon and Chris Kramers, two cheerful Dutch girls in their early 20s, embark on a long-awaited trip to celebrate their scholar achievements and Lizanne's graduation. Traveling is such a wonderful experience, and they intend to make the best of it by learning Spanish and volunteering at a local school in the process. They've spent months saving up for the trip and organizing every bit of it. They even raised funds to buy things for the children in the school. That's how invested they've been from the get-go. And now the day has finally come. They say their goodbyes and embark on the plane, not knowing that this first trip will also be their last and that the turning point is just a couple of weeks away. Their story will make the headlines all over the world, and sadly, they will never be reunited with their loved ones in their homeland again. Their story to this day remains a mystery, as neither the Panamanian nor the Dutch authorities were able to figure out what exactly happened to them. Hi, hey, hello, welcome or welcome back to the channel. Happy New Year and may this be the best one yet. In today's story, the sheer amount of inconsistencies and various aspects of the case opened the way to an endless series of theories and speculations, not just by internet sleuths worldwide, but also by the media, the locals, the families themselves, I mean, when there are no definitive answers and when there isn't enough proof to actually determine which hypothesis is the one above all others, then the debate can go on forever. And so it does. Today, the families have gone their separate ways because they do not see eye to eye when it comes to what happened to their daughters. And who could blame either for thinking one way or the other anyways? Everyone grieves differently and one has to hang on to the truth that they need to believe in order to survive such a tragedy and move forward accordingly. At least that's what I think. But in all of this, my brain got overwhelmed. And so to push through, I decided to cut things up into more digestible pieces for me and for you. So this will be a two-part video. In part one, I expose the facts and the official theory that has been chosen by the Panamanian authorities as to what most likely happened. And in part two, I confront that version, which is still a theory, by asking all of the questions that have arose since it all happened. And I go through the different theories I've come across. And I want to remind you that all of the speculations that I will be touching on are just that, speculations and theories. No matter how sure of themselves people may be, at the end of the day, there are only theories, even the official Panamanian final stance on the case is a theory in itself. I say this so you keep an open mind here in the comments and everywhere else. Without further ado, let's get into the story. It's the 15th of March of 2014. Chris and Lizanne say goodbye to their parents at the airport and embark on a plane headed to Costa Rica. After a layover in Houston and a long, long trip, they finally arrive in Costa Rica, where they take another long trip, this time on a bus, then by taxi. The taxi driver is driving so fast that Chris doesn't dare look at the road. Lizanne writes, I would not want to be found dead in San Jose. Although the chances of this is quite high in San Jose. Little does she know, she has it the other way around, and the haven for tourists that they are headed towards, where the crime rate is much lower than in most of Latin America, allegedly, is going to prove itself far deadlier than they could have ever expected. They thankfully arrive in one piece in Bocas del Toro in Panama where they've planned to stay for a well-earned two weeks vacation before they head out to Boquete in the region of Chiriqui to volunteer in the local school. Bocas del Toro, despite its reputation for being a drug-dealing hotspot, reveals itself to be a beautiful place where they enjoy themselves fully. The beautiful beaches, the tanning, the starfish, the fresh coconuts, the nightclubs and newfound friends make this first part of their adventure a super fun one that they both describe as fantastic. Lizanne even jokingly contemplates living in Bocas in her retirement days. Their days are filled with Spanish classes, drinks, card games, naps, and adventures, and their nights with cooking classes, dancing, and drinking until late into the night. After a wonderful time in Bocas, they say goodbye to their newfound friends, and reality sets in when they arrive at their host's house in Boquete. 
Miriam, her three children, and her two grandchildren are kind and used to receiving guests who don't speak Spanish at their home, just a couple of kilometers away from the Spanish school where the girls are enrolled in on their ongoing journey to learning Spanish. However, the language barrier and the change of ambiance is more challenging than what Lizanne had expected, and she finds herself in a bit of a panic, wishing that she was at home with her parents. She writes in her diary that she is in over her head, and that she somewhat suspected from the start that she wasn't cut out for this, but that she has to be strong and go through with it. Chris, who also expresses a little bit of anxiety at the idea of arriving in the house of a family that they don't know, and can barely talk to, seems a little more positive at this point. It's also Lizanne's first trip alone outside of the Netherlands, if I remember correctly, whereas Chris has already traveled, so I guess it's fairly normal that she be more confident. But they have little time to dwell, because the very next day they are to start their volunteering work at the elementary school. When they get there to introduce themselves, they are instantly dismissed. The headmaster tells them that she doesn't need any volunteers, at least not this week, and that they can come back the following week because the school isn't ready for them. What's odd is that she acts like she doesn't know who they are and what they're doing there, when the girls have not only been planning this for a month, but they've also received a message confirming the start of their project on the day before. This might have something to do with the Spanish school responsible for organizing their trip and coordinating the volunteering projects. But nevertheless, they are particularly affected by this. They both write that they feel extremely disappointed and not welcome there. So they go back to the Spanish by the river school, uh, through which they booked basically everything, by the way. I snooped on their website and was able to see pretty much the package that the girls might have booked. Two weeks in Bocas del Toro, followed by two weeks in Boquete, extendable by doing some volunteering in one of the various local organizations. The school also offers a range of activities like deep diving, dolphin sightseeing, a visit to the sloth reserve, coffee farm tours, cooking classes, evenings at restaurants, nightclubs, practically all things that the girls have done in Bocas already, according to their diaries, in addition to Spanish classes. The school even provides people with a choice of accommodations and it is likely through them that they were introduced to Miriam in Boquete. A great concept, if you ask me. While I was digging, I kind of wanted to go. By the way, I want to thank Scarlett R., who so kindly took an enormous amount of her own free time to translate the girls' diaries, as well as a lot of interviews and shows originally in Dutch, so that we could get more insight into the case. She also compiled loads of documents, photos, and wrote very interesting blog posts about the case on her blog, which I will link below, along with her YouTube channel, because they were a precious resource in the making of this video. So back to the girls. They are back at the Spanish school trying to find a volunteering project for the week with a woman named Marjolaine, a staff member of the school apparently. They find a project that seems interesting to them, however they need to wait for the organization to get back to Marjolaine with an answer. And in the meantime, there are many adventures to be had and activities to choose from. However, each activity offered by the school has to be paid for in money or through volunteering, so I guess this could explain why they choose to go on this hike on their own rather than to pay a guide to accompany them, a particular guide known in time for his experience on these trails as well as for his tendency for inappropriate behavior towards female tourists, visits the school on the 31st, sees the girls and says hola. Although he's the one that attested to that in the first place, he will deny having even met the girls at the school years later so let's give him the benefit of the doubt whether or not they discussed the pianista hike with him prior to going thus remains unclear nevertheless according to him they book a tour of his coffee plantation for the 2nd of april at 8 a.m they're allegedly set out to be accompanied by a third girl a german girl keep that in mind we'll circle back to that in a moment the Pianista Trail is supposed to be a beautiful 2-3 to three hour walk up to the summit at about 1890 meters above sea level, so 62,000 feet, then a 2-3 to three hour walk back down the same way. They do discuss hiking it on their own at the school on the 31st, and the staff allegedly warns them about going without a guide. 
Despite being described as rather wise and thoughtful girls, the next day, on April the 1st, they have brunch at a restaurant called El Sabroson, allegedly, then go to the school again before they get picked up by a taxi who takes the two of them to the base of the trail. He says that he drops them off at about 1.40 p.m., which aligns with what the staff back at the school says when they report having seen the girls leave shortly after 1 p.m. When the driver drops them off, they are at a sort of crossroads, unsure whether to take a path or another to get to the trail. They cross paths with a local living nearby at La Casa de Pedro and ask him if that's the way to the Pianista Trail. He says it's the Piedra de Lino Trail and suggests that they hike that trail instead because it's a shorter hike and a nice one as well, given that the Pianista Trail takes a good 2-3 to three hours to get to the summit and that it is nearly 2 p.m. he thinks that they are not going to have a lot of daylight left when they get to the top. Now mind you, it gets dark between 5 and 6 p.m. at this time of year over there. But although they take his advice, he sees them coming back down merely 15 minutes later. Lisanne's brother would later reveal in an interview that there was work being done on the road to that trail, with excavators and such, and that there was no way to go on. So this is where there seems to be another discrepancy, as they are said to have been seen asking for the way back to Boquete at around that time by two people, but they are also seen going up the Pianista Trail at around the same time by two other people. The owner of a restaurant called Il Pianista, located around the bottom of the trail, also says that his dog Azul accompanied the girls on the trail, which cannot be confirmed because he is nowhere to be seen on their photos and not mentioned by other witnesses, one of which is a local woman living by the trail who also saw them coming up at around 2 p.m. So let's say that they've changed their minds and they go up the trail after all. Their photos, which will be recovered months later, reveal that they were indeed on the Pianista Trail. However, oddly enough, the metadata on their camera indicates that they would have been on the trail already by 11 a.m. So that's another mysterious inconsistency, and although the camera could have not been set to the right time, the way their shadows are cast on the summit photos would seem to corroborate that it was early afternoon. But then again, on the summit photos, there are shadows cast in different directions, cloudy skies, clear skies, all of which are a bit confusing when the photos are supposedly taken only seconds apart and would make more sense if the photos of the summit had been taken at two different moments, for example, on the way forward into the trail and on the way back, but that does not concur with the order in which the photos are taken, so make it make sense. Moving on. They photographed themselves on their way to the summit, at the summit, a little ways beyond the summit, while crossing a small stream and a little further still. These are the last photos that appear to have been taken by the girls in normal circumstances. At around 4 p.m., the girls try to reach 112, the Dutch equivalent of 911, then 911, but they are unable to catch a signal. If they've passed the summit early in the afternoon, then they've reached the little stream on the last photo that we see Chris on, pretty early on in the afternoon as well, because it's not far from the summit. Then, still before 4 p.m., they should have reached the second stream, which is only 20 minutes away from the first one by foot. And they most likely would have taken another photo at the second stream, because it's a beautiful little waterfall. But they didn't, hence why Chris's parents think that they didn't reach that point, or that they weren't able to take out their camera at this point anymore for some reason. Something either happened before that second stream that made it impossible for them to carry on taking pictures, although they were moving forward into the forest, which is odd because they were still able to dial 112 and 911 after all, or they would have had to turn back already at this point, towards the summit again, on the way back to Boquete, then found themselves in trouble upon their return. All of this is if we consider that the camera metadata was correct regarding the timestamps. 
If, however, they did go up at around 2 p.m. like everybody seems to remember, then they would have reached the summit at around 4 p.m. at the earliest before their emergency phone calls were made, then gotten to where their last photos were taken, probably around when the calls were made and not that long before the sun would set. Either way, they will go on to turn their phones on and off many times in the following days in an effort to call for help, up until Lisanne's cell phone runs out of battery to never be turned on again. Chris's phone, on the other hand, in between the 6th and the 10th of April will be turned on a number of times, but an incorrect PIN code will be entered each time. It's unclear who is trying to access the phone and why, because the emergency numbers are accessible on these phones with or without the PIN code. However, it's possible that they didn't know that or that they are not trying to call for help but rather to access the phone itself. It could be one of the girls trying to use the phone for something else, maybe to record a message, take a photo, try to reach her relatives or it could be a third party with the intention of checking the phone, who knows. What we do know is that they do not return to town and are never seen alive again. Back in town. On the 2nd of April, the tour guide that they have allegedly booked for the coffee plantation tour is waiting on them at the school with the German girl. Remember? Seeing how they are not turning up and with the German girl telling him that this is uncharacteristic of them to be late, they go up to their host's house to see if they are there. Miriam has not seen the girls. Allegedly, she's waited for them for dinner the night before, then, thinking they were out, went to bed. In the morning, she left breakfast out for them, thinking they were sleeping in, then went to work. She tells the tour guide where he can find a spare key to their room and he proceeds to let himself in with the German girl, allegedly, and to take a look around for about 30 to 45 minutes before he goes back out and makes his way to the school to call the authorities. The next day, he sets out on the trail to look for the girls, allegedly, and that's about the same day that Sinaproc, aka the authorities, launches a rescue search team onto the trail as well. On the 6th of April, the families of both the girls, which still haven't heard from them, fly in from the Netherlands with Dutch detectives and the whole thing blows up. An extensive search operation lasting about 10 days at first, with dogs and everything is launched, but they find nothing. Even with a reward of initially $25,000 for any information that would lead to the girls being found, still nothing. The parents eventually have to return to their country, and according to the tour guide in an interview, the searches are stopped as soon as the parents leave the country. It's only when they return, over a month later, that they announce to the press, addressing the girls directly, that they will not leave them there alone and that this time they will stay as long as necessary to find them, that the local authorities, under international media scrutiny, must have felt the pressure and got back to work on the case. But alas, still nothing. The parents think raising the reward to $30,000 may be more incentivizing for people to go against what may be organized crime and whatnot and speak up despite potential backlash. Shortly thereafter, Lisanne's backpack turns up on the Culebra riverbank, kind of wedged in between a rock and the water. There's water on the inside, along with a bit of sand, a snail, a shell, and a little dirt on the outer part. There's also a straight cut in the material along the seam, just a couple of inches, but not any significant damage to this basic lycra backpack, considering it has been lost in the jungle and it seems in the river no less, exposed to torrential rains and whatnot for months at this point. One would expect it to be in a pretty bad state, but hey, maybe the bag was one of those guaranteed for life, East bag type of things, right? Anywho, the electronic gear found inside the bag provided a bunch of data after it had been dried up, because yes, it miraculously hadn't been damaged that much either. Now I can tell you this, when I was in Costa Rica, my laptop screen died and was never recoverable, just because of the humidity in the air, and I didn't just stay there for long, nor did it fall in the water or anything of the sort. Anyways, the bag contained the cell phones, the camera, an SD card, sunglasses, their two bras folded up, and a water bottle. 
The phone logs were recovered and revealed the information that I mentioned earlier about their numerous attempts to call for help and the interesting activity of Chris's phone over the 10 days after their disappearance. The camera and SD card were also functional and revealed all of the photos that they had taken on their trip up until then. In that regard, things get odd after the last two photos of their hike, which appeared normal and confirmed that they had passed the summit and continued beyond the end of the Pianista Trail for a bit at least. But then, nothing for eight days, and on the early morning of April 8th, over 80 photos taken in the dark, Blair Witch Project style. Nothing but trees, leaves, raindrops, rocks and also a photo showing a branch on which they had tied bits of red plastic bags, almost as though they were trying to mark their way or indicate a direction of some sort. And another photo with bits of paper, their map torn into bits in fact. They set it up around a mirror and some sort of strap on a rock. We could speculate that the mirror would have been to signal their position by reflecting the sunlight maybe for the helicopters, who knows. A couple of other very eerie photos were found, one showing what looks like Chris's hair and the other one showing a skin close-up uh, resembling a jawline, although it could have been something else. And the last thing that caught people's attention and puzzled everyone is that there was a photo in the sequence and only one that was missing. Photo 509 was nowhere to be found and unrecoverable from the camera even with special programs to recover deleted photos. It also just happens to be the photo in between the happy hiking photos and the eerie night photos. The photo could not have been deleted by the girls from the camera or else it would have been recoverable, so what happened to it? Well, we know that the Panamanian government, when they were handed the backpack and its contents, modified the photos directly on the SD card, which means that they could have very well deleted the photo or overwritten it. So that may explain this, but it would be considered tampering with the evidence and also it was already a red flag as to how the case was handled altogether. Furthermore, every item recovered had many different prints all over from multiple people handling the items. So the case was not treated as though there could potentially have been foul play, which made it almost impossible down the road to examine things in that regard. Shortly after the backpack was recovered, a few bones were also found on the banks of the river along with the bones of other humans, which in itself is weird. But if we ignore that detail and keep our eyes on the big picture, only a very small percentage of their actual remains were recovered. Two leg bones from Lisanne, along with one of her shoe, still containing her foot which had been broken in several parts, and a rolled up piece of her skin, which Ali again, had not decomposed. The boot was found almost underneath a tree trunk in the rainforest by the tour guide and his team. There was also a rib and a pelvic bone identified as belonging to Chris, but that was it. Oh yeah, her jean shorts were found as well further along the river, but that's, that's about it. Very few remains, not enough for Chris's parents to consider this as some sort of closure. Despite all of their efforts, the Panamanian authorities were vastly criticized for the way they handled the case from A to Z. They took too long to get up and running. They treated the investigation as though it was a case of two girls lost in the jungle with little regard for the many witness testimonies and for the way evidence is handled traditionally. Whether it was negligence, inexperience, or lack of means and resources is unclear, but all of the questions as to what happened to these girls are still in the air. For at least some people who don't believe that they got lost or accidentally hurt in the jungle. As for the Panamanian government's official statement, the girls got lost in the jungle beyond the trail, one or both may have gotten hurt, they might have tried to cross a monkey bridge in the jungle to find help and slipped to their deaths down onto the rocks in the river beneath. After that, the current would have swept them away and they would have rapidly decomposed in the jungle, <clears throat> unlike their backpack. Or they could have died of hunger and dehydration in the depth of the jungle after having been immobilized by an injury. 
an explanation that wasn't convincing for the locals and then some who think that if they were indeed lost in the jungle, they would have been found considering the extent of the search. That and other things that we will discuss in part two, where I will let you in on the alternative theories, hypotheses, and speculations on the case. Might I add that there had been deaths in similar circumstances in that area prior to this case, and that there have been around 50 other deaths in the area, again in similar circumstances since then. Don't forget to subscribe to be notified when I post part two. Like the video if you found it interesting. And that's it for part one. I will see you in the next one. Bye.